and concentration and attention, pardon me, attention are uh, key for this. Um, there is a danger too that comes from this divide concept uh, to let ceremonial magic be infiltrated by psychological models. Um, so we find some people who do still practice this stuff but try to keep it compartmentalized again into sort of an, either an academic mindset or the idea that you know, this is all just psychology, we're just like learning to affect our minds and there's nothing sort of supernatural or extra-worldly about it, which I think is, um, I think actually makes people vulnerable to uh, these deeper problems because they are in a sense explaining away their actions and keeping it separate from their day-to-day -day reality. Whereas I think the goal should be uh, to bring this magical universe into your reality and to fully inhabit that reality and make it a, a consistent part of your life. And that makes it a lot more powerful and a lot more effective. Um, so that's the tool, the tool aspect um, in terms of the circle and the triangle. But uh, that's not, obviously, it's not the only way that you can perform an invocation. Invocation is, many, in many ways, very simple, um, because you are really just calling on a spirit, or in, in which case you would have, like, a, a something that you would say or recite, or, you know, really, like, uh, a lot of the people say, or a lot of the experts say that the best material sort of comes spontaneously, uh, not necessarily something that you prepare or memorize or recite in terms of a, a solid invocation. Um, in the uh, John D. diaries, there's one point where he's trying really persistently to try to get the angels to give him a good way to invoke them. And they're like, well, you got the keys. And other than that, like, we can't tell you how to invoke us. Like, you know, it has to proceed purely from the heart of man. Um, and that's where we get that connection. And, uh, oh, and, and, and a lot of times that's when things are the most powerful. Whereas an invocation is far more formal, far more structured, um, partly because we are trying to um, manifest, maybe not physically, but manifest in some sense in our plane these energies. So it's uh, it's a lot easier to uh, fuck that up, frankly. <laughs> um, you get a leak, so to speak, and uh, you've got problems. And you've got problems that can last for a while, and it's not always that easy to just get rid of these. You know, there's a like I say, there is a tendency to overfocus on banishing because. While it's very important to do, it doesn't. It's also not always as effective, um, and it's not always effective. And you have to have a pretty clear idea, especially if you're going to perform an evocation and you've got a spirit there. You probably don't want it hanging around a lot. And I've experimented with this a lot myself because I went through a phase personally of um, I would instead of banishing after an evocation, I would invoke, try to. Sorry, is this the meetup? That's yeah. right. Okay. <clears throat> My apologies. Sorry. Um, yeah, just as in an effort to try to like keep the energy around, keep it active. My my thinking at the time was, well, I went to all this trouble to get this thing here. I want to I want it to hang out and, and work, do some work for me and stuff like that. Um, and I will say from experience, that's a really bad idea. <laughs> and uh, I would advise people not to. You know, I, I certainly conduct your own experiments look at your own results, but I would say that goes very badly most of the time. Um, just because, particularly if you're doing, uh, working with infernal or goetic spirits, because they tend to work through misfires. Even when they're giving you what they want, just their whole nature is to cause accidents, mistakes, mess things up, lapses in attention, which is really good when it's working for you, but um, it's not always the easiest thing in the world to, uh, to just get rid of. Uh, once it's once it's gotten started, and the more a spirit tends to inhabit a space, the more comfortable it gets there, and the easier it can show up again. Uh, not necessarily because it was invited. Um, what we're trying to do here by incorporating this stuff into our day-to-day -day lives is to create kind of a liminal space um, between the uh, the day-to-day -day world and the spiritual universe to the point at which we don't see a separation between those things and that we can actually use this effectively. Um, now, a big part of where this space comes from has to do with, um, in many ways, the genesis of Gnosticism. I mean, I, I, don't, I, I don't know if all of us here are Thelemites, but um, Thelema is a Gnostic tradition, and um, 
ceremonial magic is very closely related to Gnosticism because that was sort of the branch of Christianity which was the most ritually active, um, which caused a lot of problems for them. And that's a big part of the history of that. But this is like intrinsically connected to just the alphabet itself. Um, if we look at early forms of writing, a lot of them are pictorial representations of, uh, of actual things out there in the world. Sometimes not very sophisticated, but still, they, it, it's, it's a one-to-one. -one. You look at something and it's like, okay, well this is a deer, or you know, this is uh, one of our gods, or this is, this is wheat, you know, uh, like with early Egyptian stuff. Um, and it's, you start to see this divide that uh, Latour and anthropologists talk about begin to crop up when you start to see actual alphabets, because those aren't a strict one-to-one -one representation. It's the letters that represent sounds, and uh, we have to, this then becomes a disconnect between the concept and the thing that uh, develops our conceptual minds. Um, there's a Platonic dialogue uh, called the Phaedro, where Plato kind of talks about this idea um, quite a bit. And interestingly, he's very critical of it. Um, he's very critical of the use of language and of writing. Um, and that's very significant because Plato was among the first generations of people to um, come out of a place where they actually had a thorough education system where people were consistently taught to read and write. So this was a, a new kind of concept. And it's not too hard to put together the idea that new technology affects the way that we think. I mean, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I don't know anyone's phone number. I haven't known anyone's phone number for 10 years, you know. And there was once a time when I had an encyclopedia of phone numbers in my head. And since we no longer have the need to develop that skill, we, uh, we let it fall apart. Um, and that's, that's a big deal. I mean, around the same time, uh, you've got guys like Aristotle talking about, you know, how to improve memory and how to think about things. And he would talk about, he had a city in his head where he wanted to remember something, he would go to a particular place mentally in the city and open up a book or open up a drawer and look at the thing that he was trying to remember. That level of visualization is what made it possible for people in the ancient world to uh, create the amazing pieces of art and architecture that they did um, without, uh, without the benefit of our technologies. And this is important, this relationship is important to look at because, uh, you know, ceremonial magic is a form of technology. Um, and there's a lot of people uh, who really grasp onto that. And I think it's an important idea to think about. I would caution, um, I would make the same cautionary statement that I did about the psychological models before, where for certain people I think it becomes a way to step back and compartmentalize and not to uh, fully engage themselves in, uh, in their practices. Um, but it is interesting to look at this because you know all of our technologies um, give us something and they take something away. Um, yeah, like how cell phones, for example, could be, and like the internet, are stopping us from developing our psychic communication with one another because oh, yeah. we're dependent on that instead. Um, I think that's something that definitely our society is. Um, we're still adjusting by. to this, yeah. this whole thing, like very much so. Um, and it becomes, it, it is a difficult way to communicate because unless you're really, I mean, we were talking about this just in the pre thing earlier. If you don't know the context that someone like makes a Facebook status update and then uh, it can be weird, it's very easy to misinterpret stuff like that or get the wrong idea. But I have a lot of um, psychic abilities and I use the internet all the time, so <laughs> I don't, uh, like, uh, I'm on the internet all the time too. Yeah. yeah. There's a really <laughs> interesting uh, book about this um, by a guy. He actually did a spot on the Lima Coast to Coast, but it was on a different, um, it was about a different book uh, called Eric Davis. And the book is called Technosis. And he's kind of like, analyze, pardon me, analyzes uh, the re developing relationship between technology and, uh, and mystical practices. What makes it particularly interesting to read now is it came out in 1998. So, um, you know, at this point, it's very, it, you can see it is very precognitive of what was coming because this was really a time when the net was just starting to be integrated with what we're, I mean, it's been around since the 80s, but it certainly was in common practice and common use. And for a long time, people were very suspicious of it. Like, people didn't like putting their names online, they didn't like ordering things from online vendors and stuff like that. And that's all out the window now. Well, everyone's pretty comfortable with that. Um, What we can look at in terms of uh, the language aspect is this is 